Hi, my name is Alex S. Johnson, and I'm reading uh, a story I wrote called uh, Horror is a Melon on Stilts. This is um, from the Outlaw Circus collection from uh, James Ward Kirk Fiction. I've always been attracted to fresh fruit. It is not exactly a fetish, though fetishistic elements are most certainly involved. Any bargain basement Freudian may, with justification, adduce primal scenes of childhood picnics in a cool wedge of watermelon, abating my desire for a nanny or something equally tiresome. Nevertheless, I cannot easily mask the excitement I feel in markets or grocery stores, mentally caressing the swollen nubs of ripe strawberries, inhaling the urgent sexual odor of papaya, secretly and in actuality palpating the skin of a peach, or fondling the smooth carapace of a banana. Before I became aware that my feelings were for fruit were unusual, it was easy to hide my desires behind a dietitian's practicality or even a cover as mundane and obvious as that of an amateur salad chef training himself to choose the best produce. I often had the same delicious sensation as when I made an experiment in fully clothed nudism. At home, I released and cooled my swollen genitals at times, wrapping them in slices of kiwi fruit or, or stroking them with cherry stems. <laughs> even though I was hurting nobody, not even bruising the fruit, I began to feel a secret sense of shame as I went through the motions of my day job as a file clerk for Wilhelm Hospital. I, I could barely constrain the urge to rush out and buy an extravagant amount of fruit and carry it back to my one-room apartment like a Viking's plunder. Any desire ungoverned and allowed infinite play can with time become unwholesome. And so it was with my craving for fruit as it developed into a dark addiction. It, at my lowest point, I began to hire call girls first to roll around in raspberry sauce or, or banana cream as I jerked myself to oblivion. My mind was not on their silicone-enhanced breasts or shapely posterior so much as the fruit itself. Then, to watch me as I plunged my engorged member into peaches, plums, pears, lemons, tangerines, grapefruit, and more. The citrus family added the tang of pain to my sordid sessions with the fruit. But that only increased my pleasure. I cannot yet fathom why, after months of sallies into a private underground of fruit-based eroticism. The tables were turned. All I know is that one day I was scoping out a fresh arrival of melons at my local supermarket when something snapped. They tell me I was discovered among piles of demolished watermelons covered with wet seeds and sticky strands raving about the horror of melons on stilts. After paying a fine and agreeing to therapy and behavior modification, I stayed away from fruit, except as nourishment. I began to add other foods to my menu and over time overcame my addiction, or at least I thought. One night I stopped at a liquor market to buy a pack of cigarettes, 
The market was located on a corner next to an alleyway that I had always avoided because of the musty smells and odd whispers that floated through the darkness at the end. It, it was always dark in that alley, no matter the season or the time of day, but I had ran out of smokes and my need was urgent. Even if I had to pay the exorbitant price charged by the Pakistani owner, owner and step into the shadow of the alley. As I came out of the store, greedily ripping the cellophane from the box and plucking a fresh cigarette, I heard a voice coming from the alley. It was clearly speaking my name. My only wish at that point was to get back into my Honda Accord, which was parked behind the market, crank up Black Sabbath's Master of Reality album, and floor it all the way home, drowning all thoughts of dark alleyways, sinister mutterings, and yes, fruit-related trauma in an orgy of alcohol and heavy metal, but my feet were paralyzed. Instead of moving toward my car, I found myself walking towards down the alley with its crusted, peeling ads for bananas and kumquats and tomatoes, the ecstatic, humid scents of rotting apples, the lurid undertow of cantaloupes, prunes, plums, and grapes. Martin, said the voice. I peered into the darkness, my heart pounding. Despite my fear, a little of the old fruit lust had begun to plump my loins. I feared what my therapist and the court-appointed shrink had called decompensation, but I couldn't resist the lure. I had to face the beast, even if I perished in the encounter. Then, suddenly, I saw, standing at the end of the alley, fully ten feet tall, the melon on stilts. It was speaking through a mouth carved in the skin, wet, mushy syllables that gradually registered as a challenge, a warning, an invitation. According to the melon, my attack in the supermarket had violated some fruit code of ethics. He recalled for my benefit the events I still could not remember. As he spoke, that terrible moment in the supermarket slowly trickled into consciousness. Rogue watermelons had opened fire on me, spitting seeds like gatling guns. Before I could properly react or defend myself, I was swathed in a sticky cocoon of white fibers. Naturally, I fought back, instinctively using my knowledge of the fruit's weak points to thwart its destructive agenda, but by then the melons had extruded their stilts. I was thumped, battered, pounded, and left for dead in a spreading pool of watermelon juice. The police had been abrupt and dismissive of my claims that the fruit had attacked first, and one cop actually laughed when I brought up the stilts. According to the melon, the attack had been precipitated by an ultra-conservative faction among the melons, a purist sect that was outraged by my secret debauches with their kind. This was revenge. But now I had been given a second chance. The gauntlet had been dropped for a rematch. Although I have many flaws, cowardice is not among them. The following day after work, I returned to the alley to confront my assailants. I was armed this time with salad tongs, various knives, strainers, a battery-operated oper Cuisinart. I stepped boldly into the alley and fought the melons with all my strength. Soon they began to drop around me, still splintering and breaking beneath them, sticky gobbets of pink flesh and marbled green rind falling at my feet. At some point, a a white flag was waved, a truce signed. When I told my therapist what had transpired, she said that she was worried about my state of mind. She could not understand that my battle with the melons was in fact the outcome of our sessions, that I had finally surmounted my ambivalent relationship with fruit and was free now to enjoy it in a normal way, without wanting to to fuck it, or, or smear it across a whore's face as I sang a warped, manic version of the Chiquita Banana song. I finally convinced her that my story was only a metaphor, that I didn't actually believe I had been summoned to Guerre à l'Utrance, 
with elevated produce, but I could sense her concern, even after I had assured her that the crisis point had been reached and resolved. Many weeks of peace passed after the incident in the alley. I began dating again and even dared to order fruit salad and eat it in full daylight in the public eye with no untoward cravings. I congratulated myself and my willpower and endurance. One night I decided to walk home from work and took a series of side streets. I was determined to enjoy myself and take the time to really appreciate my surroundings and increased sense of well-being. Then I turned a corner and my heart sank at the vision of row upon row of eggplants in wheelchairs, their stubby green fingers poised over the wheel rims. They tell me my release from the clinic is imminent and that I will soon be able to take unsupervised walks around the neighborhood. I am optimistic despite the fact that the nurse who tends to me has developed a purplish cast to her face and sometimes smells faintly of marinara sauce.